Hello and welcome to Policy Bazaar. I'm Arjun Bhagat and today we are going to take the conversation forward on what uh, the budget has in store for us and how you can leverage it to plan and save better in the new financial year. Earlier we talked about the impact of the budget on our finances. We also learned about various schemes announced by the Finance Minister Arun Jaitley which uh, would help India move from the Jan Dhan financial inclusion to Jan Suraksha social security. Now this included the likes of universal social security scheme and the pension scheme. Now in this episode we're going to delve deeper into the specifics of Budget 2015. And joining us in our studio is Yashish Saya, CEO and co-founder of Policy Bazaar. Welcome to the uh, show, Yashish. Hi. Overall, it seems to be a pretty positive um, budget, you know, and which is going to uh, help India move forward. A uh, lot yep. of infrastructure, uh, infrastructure initiatives, a lot of uh, social, uh, social security schemes which India needs. Um, what are some of the negatives that you feel could have been addressed in this budget? See, uh, the budget is a directional budget. It is the first step in, one is assuming a series of, uh, of uh, uh, years which would uh, eventually lead us towards our conclusion. But if you look back at when uh, the current government was formed, there were a few uh, promises made. One was there would be some kind of universal security. Uh, second was ease of business, as we call it. Uh, we are one of the worst company countries in the world in terms of ease of business. 150 or yeah, something, we are, we're like, something like that. Sure. We're, we're in the last quartile. We kind of uh, come close to Zambia and countries like that. Uh, whereas countries like Singapore and the US are really in the top three, four. Uh, the objective was to move from somewhere down there to the at least the top half. Right. And uh, I think fundamentally one took that away. That if you allow ease of business, and so people are free to do things that would provide some impetus. And the second being uh, social security would be provided to uh, those in need of it because without that, things get very difficult. I think there was a third thing mentioned, which was about uh, the 100 city plan. You know, we were going to have 100 cities and the bullet trains. And uh, I think, if anything, the third aspect is uh, maybe the government has decided that it's only going to follow two, not the third one. Right, which is uh, the which is the smart which is, a, which is the smart cities, the the bullet trains, connectivity, because we have not seen anything on that front so far whatsoever. So if you come to the specifics of the budget, yes, uh, there was an increase in excise duty, which uh, went from twelve point three six to fourteen percent. From what I understand of people, people barely... That's the service tax. That's the service tax, sorry. Right, the service right. tax, the service tax, sorry. The, the, the service tax is not something people observe every day. Right. It's going up by 1%, 1.5%. One it's being looked, uh, the excise increase in excise and service tax is being looked uh, towards as a little bit of a dampener as far as yeah, the Yeah, it's there. Especially the middle classes. It is, it is there, but I don't think everybody looks at it extremely seriously. It is, it, is, it is a cost, it is a cost, and you know, people undertake that cost when people... For the government, it is fantastic because it's, it's a big earner of money because expenses do happen. And the good part is even people who earn money in black do spend money. And when they spend money, the service tax will come in. So when they have to pay the bills, the service tax will be there. So, so clearly there's an, there's an advantage of the service tax element, uh, you know, the, which, is, which is more universal in nature. However, we have seen no uh, benefit going in in terms of home ownership. Right. Today it is extremely difficult. And we are seeing this in the developed world also. So in a very developed country like the UK, there's a lot of support being given uh, to the young to get started on what you call the property ladder. Right. Uh, you know, once Warren's got one property, then that property's price increases, he can sell that and buy another one or, or something of that sort. But the first step today, if you look at a place like Gurgaon or Bangalore, uh, there aren't houses available for less than one crore rupees. Right. Whereas the salaries have moved, but they haven't moved at the same pace. And uh, I think that gap, and interest rates and interest continue rates to are be quite high. high. And interest rates continue to be very high. So I think there isn't really support in terms of the first house. And I think that part of the economy is getting left out. So I would so say. So you, you feel that is a major uh, area. I think. Uh, see, if we look at the different areas, there's the agricultural sector, there is the manufacturing sector, uh, there is the SME uh, group of people, and there is what you would call the salaried class. Uh, and I think a lot of the SMEs and the salaried class are looking at buying houses in the urban 
right. world. Right. Because the agricultural group has got the, the agricultural subsidies going and nobody's touching that. That's, that's perfectly fine. It's, it's a very large group and that should be supported. Uh, whereas the manufacturing part is getting their advantages in terms of slightly lower corporate tax, etc. So the big advantage coming in in terms of aligning the nature of our corporate taxes with the rest of the ASEAN countries. Right. So most of the ASEAN countries that are working between... So, so we'll get to that yeah. in, in a I think, bit. I think, I think, I think the, uh, there is really no support provided to the first-time home buyer, who is an important uh, part of the middle class. And I would say, I, I don't want to call them lower middle class because it's just the age. Given, this, given that, um, you're right, because our majority of our population is below 35. Now. It's below 35. And it's that young population, as they get into jobs, if they don't have places to live in, uh, or they don't have, if they don't have the ability to buy their first house, I think that's going to become a strain on society one way or the other. Right. And what about ATC? Because there seems to be, and I asked you this question even earlier, there seems to be this little bit of a disgruntlement in terms of, you know, whether, you know, no push has been given to the middle class. But there has been in some ways, because, I mean, the other justification that the finance minister gave was, you know, I gave, I increased the limit of 2 lakh to 2 lakh 50,000 less than eight months back. Yeah. So does that argument really hold? Uh, yeah, so, Is uh, that a consolation? <laughs> see, given how inflation has moved uh, and given how uh, government pensions have moved, uh, you know, the pay commissions, etc., I think very little is done in terms of the tax benefits which are provided to the middle class. See, the middle class is the, is the primary group that is paying taxes. If you look right. at the 3% of the people who pay taxes, I'm pretty that's confident. That's less than 3 crores in this country. That is right? less than 3 crore people. Direct taxpayers. But a bulk of them, bulk of the tax paid would be from the middle class. So I think a right. middle class pays a disproportionate amount of tax compared to its income. Right? Uh, because the rich have the way to kind of structure taxes in a manner that taxes are very well managed. And I think... Uh, at the other end, there is either black income or there isn't income to, to pay taxes on. So clearly, that group is saying we need some relief, which at least keeps up with inflation. And if you look at the last five years, uh, six, seven years, it's been at one lakh rupees. And it's gone to one and a half lakh rupees, but that is 50% over seven years. That does not even keep up with inflation. Right. So uh, I think um, going to a two lakh or a three lakh would be the right step. But the government is doing what is practical. Right. Uh, they are constrained. They, we don't have so much funds that we can kind of... Start. So I think it is the least bad option, if you would. Uh, but clearly, uh, I think it's a fair ask. The middle class is saying we are working hard. We are bringing in the taxes for the entire country. Uh, at least you can do is give us, give us some back. relief, at least in line with inflation. If for the last seven, eight years, we don't even get 50% increase, then, then there's, a, there's a bit of a problem. What about um, you know the the opposition and also a lot of the middle class and upper middle class is saying it's basically a pro rich, pro corporate budget. Now I have two questions. One is, um, is it a pro rich, um, you know, budget? After all, you know they're saying that they're going to bring down the tax rates from thirty percent to twenty five percent. The second is, um, does it in any way help? You know, our viewers there. Uh, even though they seem to be very concerned about the tax rates coming down so, for the corporates. Uh, I would like to ask anybody, how is it pro-rich? Nothing that has happened in this budget is pro-rich. If anything, income tax on people earning more than one crore. Uh, now, anybody could say that people earning more than one crore have ways to kind of manage their taxes anyway. But that is a problem every government in the world is facing. Not just us. Even, yeah. even, even the European countries are facing that. When people have incomes of more than a million pounds, You've got tax structures and trust structures which basically make sure you don't pay taxes. Uh, so that is the problem the whole world is facing. Uh, we, I, think, I think streamlining would help. But uh, in fact, if I was to look a bit deeper into it, the way FDI and FII has been consolidated. Remember, a lot of the rich use these exceptions within FII and FDI to kind of break the, uh, the FDI ceilings and then you know, through lobbying, etc. So I think the government has given a very clear indication that, look, while we will move the overall uh, limits for the industry, uh, we, we are not open to this entire lobby culture of people trying to, you know, uh, negotiate their, their specific terms. And I think that's a very good thing to say that, okay, we, it's, it's non-popular, but we'll increase the overall limit. 
but at the same time we won't allow these little you know nuances which allow people to get special privileges if you would i think from that perspective it is powerful the 2% tax has come in on the rich uh i think removal of wealth tax was a very normal thing because you know it's the most open thing you could be paying all your taxes you you don't know what to pay on wealth tax precisely and so Nobody the harassment of the harassment tax in inspectors comes in and that's absolutely. some a I big think concern doing the way it was a fantastic thing so i don't think it is uh, pro rich in any way the reduction in corporate tax is a benefit to the working group because if companies make money then companies can invest money so so do we uh, once it's played out once it comes down to 25% do we actually become more competitive with our neighbors and the asean group and see if you i i look at i look at uh, some of the developed countries and their models uh, in terms of how they have taken advantage of these so if you look at the dutch economy or the irish economy you've got google based out of ireland in uh, europe why is it not based out of the uk which is a which is a very natural place for it to be you've got microsoft based out of well we've Dublin. got cyrus mistry who's an irish citizen who's an irish so <laughs> why are all these data. companies based out of ireland and not the uk uh, which is which is a natural home for for a lot of people i'm just very yeah, simple it's a very simple thing the uk has higher corporate tax than ireland ireland has the lowest corporate tax in the eurozone so why would it make sense for us to increase our corporate tax and make ourselves inefficient see we are not in this isolated world anymore every company is thinking do i set up in india or do i set up in sri lanka or do i set up in singapore so it's a very competitive environment so, and, and, and at the end of the day lanka, those decisions you. affect uh, all of us because they affect you know, all of us. a company coming in does create a lot of uh, jobs direct or indirect is, that's that's the moot point absolutely, isn't it absolutely absolutely these companies are creating not just jobs but high end jobs and skills which then nurture future future so having high end companies in manufacturing and the services come into india and invest is a fantastic thing because that is what creates the future creates obviously the employment but with that learning we get the future entrepreneurs who create further employment and further intellectual property for the country and that is necessary without that how exactly uh, does one intend to be competitive because competitive will mean competing with others not right. competing just within our own house <laughs> right and what about uh, you know the other issue that the government has talked about people are raising it uh, the opposition is raising it black money uh, how does that play out and how does that affect our viewer <laughs> in many ways i think black money is something which is uh, i don't know how they're going to control it because it's stashed in mattresses <laughs> and uh, unless they actually it's, have it's not just in the swiss <laughs> banks it's not just so okay so i don't get this how does black money get to the swiss banks mm -hmm. it's it's not very you you can't really take tons of rupees from here in bags and take them outside the country and uh, go and put them in a swiss bank because they won't even recognize the rupee currency so this money moves legitimately in some manner right so there are some tax structures there are some trust structures that are there and i am sure these are in these are in common knowledge of everybody so those structures have to be broken and these structures many of them are outside the indian law right now uh, how they have to work on it i'm not an expert in this field right but but, but clearly it's not it's not it's not the same person who's doing the uh, the you know the house business uh, selling one house to the other and taking that money in that bori that bori is getting used in india only that yeah. bori has no way of kind of making it out well property uh, properties in india huge yeah. component is uh, yeah. is black money is is black money but that money i don't see how that money can reach abroad right i i i, I it's it's beyond me how that cash can reach abroad so it's actually dollars trading abroad which is which is our problem right well it's time for a short break we're going to continue our discussion we're also going to take questions from our viewers uh, yashish but uh, do write to us tweet us at twitter at policybazaar_in and email us at queries at policybazaar.com arjun bhagat and with me is yashish dhaya and we're discussing uh, the budget 2015 2016 yashish you know we've talked about a lot of aspects of the budget but you know going back on the medical insurance front how does that pan out for the family because that has been a major thrust as far as the uh, finance minister is concerned limits have been increased how does that affect a typical family okay i think it's a it's a very interesting area to look at fundamentally because uh, uh, we had 15000 rupees as a coverage for health insurance and to be brutally honest there were not too many people taking coverage beyond 15000 rupees so what was the point of going or even reaching 15000 rupees like i barely the the average uh, 
health insurance cover uh, at our company was about 11,000 rupees. And there were very few people who would reach 15,000. So what's the point of going to 25,000? Now, uh, the reason why it's gone to 25,000, and I think it's helpful for the consumer, is they can start to take critical illness plans with it. Remember, on the shows, we've always been speaking about health insurance and critical illness. They can take top-up plans with it. And if they really run out of both those plans and they don't want to take any one of those, the simple thing is just take an OPD cover. And OPD cover is something that essentially allows you to spend on medical bills. But definitely try and utilize your entire 25,000 rupees because every time you go and spend on medicine, see, all of us spend something on the medicines. Every time we spend something on medicines, imagine if you were spending that money in a manner that you would get a tax break on it rather than you know spending it directly. And that's what the OPD cover would allow. So I think creating that structure is helpful for the family. Now, uh, the, the second uh, part of this is uh, the senior citizen uh, part. So if your parents are senior citizens, uh, their coverage is no longer 20,000, that's 30,000 rupees. And the most important part is you are still allowed to buy the policy for them and get a tax break on your income. They don't have to have the break on their income. So essentially your tax break is not just uh, 25,000 rupees, it's actually about 55,000 rupees per individual. So if you've got two members of the family earning money, it's a pretty significant tax break and you can take advantage of that uh, for uh, getting a very serious health cover for yourself. Now remember, today it may seem like a bit of a wastage that, you know, why do I have to spend all this money just to get a tax break? But health uh, inflation or medical cost inflation is one of the highest in the country. We've got a, about a 40% inflation going on for the last 7 10 to 10 years. And it would make sense to get a bigger cover than you think is necessary because if any disease strikes, and that's when you need the health. So 70% of all costs in health, health insurance come once a disease has struck. Now, you won't know when it strikes, but if it does strike, nobody's going to give you a higher cover then. So it's better to take a higher cover up front and make sure you're protected for a long duration. When one buys, a, suppose there's a 50-year-old person, a 30-year-old person, and he's buying a 3 lakh rupee health cover. He's not buying a 3 lakh rupee health cover. What he's actually getting into is a contract, which for the next 50 years would be giving... 3 lakh rupees every year. So it's one and a half crore contract that he's getting into. And one should look at it from that perspective. That is, 3 lakh going to be enough, maybe 30 years, 50 years from now. So it makes sense to kind of up it. And, the, and if there's a disease sets in, then the health insurance companies will not allow an increase. They will only allow an increase till you are fit. So I think look at it from that perspective. And from a family, yes, there is a 25,000 and there's 30,000 for the senior citizen person. Uh, and uh, th that can be clubbed together in a single person paying taxes. Right, uh, Yashish. So, you know, before we take uh, viewers' questions, uh, what, is, um, what is your final take on the budget? And how do we take advantage of it? Very quickly. I think, I think extremely prudent, non-populist. I can't think of a single person who would ever get harmed out of this budget. But it's non-partisan, it is non-favoring, and it is directional. We are moving away from uh, very heavy, uh, you know, culture of uh, subsidies and all that. We're moving into a universal health system, and we're moving into a flexible system where employees will have a lot of freedom. So just very simple things like, you know, you being able to decide whether you want to invest in EPF, PPF. Those kind of things are, you know, ground-breaking as far as uh, the Indian context is concerned, just because it starts to provide flexibility to the person whose money it is. And I think that's very, very powerful. Right. You know, we have time for maybe one or two questions from our viewers. We've got Jackie uh, Tejwani, and he says his mother is 50 years old, is diabetic, and he wants to know if there's any particular health insurance plan that he could opt for uh, maximum coverage. Also, what would the ideal amount of premium uh, investment be? Um, so, what would uh, so, he? Uh, yeah. So it doing? depends on the condition of the uh, diabetes. There is, uh, you know, type one, type two diabetes, and one's got to kind of look at both of those options. And yes, you would get a cover. So there are certain di specific diabetic covers. So Star Health has one which is uh, specific for diabetes. However, uh, most companies, if it is a type 1 diabetes, most companies would be willing to take the individual into the policy. It will be slightly more expensive. There may be some element of copay that might come in. Now, uh, the, po the companies are the same. So you know, you've got Max Bupa, Religare, Apollo. So lots uh, of choice Alliance. There. Yeah, so uh, uh, do, do explore. There's some, some very good plans out there, uh, do explore a bit. And uh, I would say if one is looking at a cover of about, uh, say, 5 lakh rupees at that age, at about 50, and with some disease having set in, then you could 
be expecting a premium of about 12 to 15,000 rupees. Right. Final question from Mr. Subramaniam. Uh, he says he's opted for a MediClaim policy, Oriental Insurance, for himself and his wife several years ago. He's 76 years old and his wife is 68 years. Uh, he would like to increase the limit of his medical cover as the medical uh, costs have increased uh, in the last few years, as we all know. Now, he has been in talks with his current insurance provider to increase the limits. However, he feels that they are a little apprehensive about getting it done. He wants to know uh, what he can do to get that uh, limit increased, uh, uh, if not by his insurance, by someone else. It's a, uh, So he can try to get a cover from another insurance company. But he certainly, certainly at that age, at that advanced age, should not look at... Uh, Porting his current plan, I think it will be very risky. Uh, and if he does port, he will only get the benefit of the... So I think he should maintain his current plan in addition to getting a separate cover if he wants to. Usually I would not advise people having two covers, but he should first get the next cover and only then think of uh, kind of moving out of this one. The second part I would say is, I think it will be very hard for his... Uh, uh, so his insurance company is correct in not willing to uh, extend the cover any further. Uh, see, the choice we have to make on what cover we want and we have to as again and again said we have to look at the next 20 years 30 years when we think of what coverage we want we shouldn't look at just today what will happen is for most of us this will happen we will reach that age of you know 75 there's there's good medical facilities there's good health care these days there's people's uh, views on health are improving so you know we many of us will live uh, till that till that good uh, old age but at that age we will require higher and higher medical costs and if our coverage is limited to 2 lakhs or 3 lakhs, we will find it very limiting and uh, the rest of the cost burden will come on to us uh, individually. Thanks a lot for joining us, uh, Yashish. Uh, and we're going to continue our discussion on budgets, uh, on this budget in the next episode as well. Uh, but uh, tweet us at Twitter at PolicyBazaar underscore in or email us at queries at PolicyBazaar.com and we'll see you. <laughs>